Welcome, everyone. My name is Achit, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Join Tiffany Wesley, advisor and project manager at ESS Dental Solutions, on this exciting webinar where you'll learn how to vacation-proof your revenue. If at any point you have a question tonight, please type it into the box labeled Have a Question, and we will conduct a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. To talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Tiffany, welcome. Thank you. It's really great to be here today. Uh, I am really looking forward to sharing lots of great material with you, and I hope that you'll be able to walk away with some super helpful information uh, that you can take back into your practices and really put to use immediately. So today we are going to be talking about how to vacation-proof your revenue. I'd like to especially give um, a shout out and thank you to ESIS for allowing me to present to you guys today. And I wanna tell you a little bit about them before we jump into the meat of our presentation. So ESIS invented optimized revenue cycle management and front office services for dentists. And for more than 10 years, the ESIS platform has been putting more money back into the pockets of the nation's dedicated dentists reducing the stress of their teams and creating more reliable cash flow. ESIS platform is comprised of dental billing specialists serving over 2,300 dental offices and DSOs. So these are just some of the uh, amazing awards and recognitions that ESIS has received over the years. And it really is impressive what all they, uh, they, they've accomplished. But the most impressive to me personally uh, is this number over here on the right of the screen. So to date, eAssist has collected more than $9.34 billion from insurance companies on behalf of dental practices all over the country. So most of you who are familiar with eAssist uh, immediately think of it as a billing service but you might not realize all of the other things that ESS does to truly serve uh, and take care of our dental practices. So these are services that often can take your admin team hours to accomplish and you're paying them for all of those hours, right? So sometimes outsourcing these services can really help to free up their time and give them more opportunity to work on the processes that are really best done within the practice uh, itself. So again, starting over here on the left, uh, ESS original focus was dental billing and insurance filing. Uh, they also offer credentialing services for dentists who may be starting out or who are new to a practice. And a huge time saver would be the insurance verification service. Um, there are unicorns out there that actually enjoy this process <laughs> and we have them at ESS, thankfully. Uh, it really is unbelievable just how much time is used by your team sitting on hold waiting to ask a few questions about uh, insurance benefits and eligibility. Then we've got accounting, bookkeeping, and payroll services, which are another amazing tool. They understand the ins and outs of a dental practice, oftentimes better than a local accountant or bookkeeper would because they focus solely on dental practices alone. Then we move along to patient portion statements and billing. So this means that eAssist has specialists who send statements and also work old balances to collect them from your patients. So many practices struggle with those phone calls and sending those statements, and they would really just prefer somebody else do the dirty work for them. And then lastly, they offer full schedule. So they have specialists who go into your practice management software to work your overdue uh, recare patients. Uh, in those that have pending treatment to get them back on the books. So here's a little bit about me and I'll let you kind of read what you want and then I'll just tell you a little bit of, more about my story and how I got started in dentistry. So oddly enough, my journey into dentistry started when I was just five years old. Um, my family was in a terrible car accident, uh, left my mother with a broken back, a broken neck, broken ribs, one of those broken ribs punctured a lung and half of it had to be removed. She suffered traumatic brain injuries and was in a coma for eight and a half weeks. On top of all of that, 
She also broke most of her lower anterior teeth, all of which had um, to be restored with major restorations. And I've just always been fascinated at how technological advancements over the years have allowed us to truly provide optimal care to our patients and not only restore function, but confidence as well. And then about 18 years ago, I took a semester off of college to find myself uh, and figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And during that process, I worked as a temp uh, in a dental office, converting their two-tab paper filing system into a three-tab paper filing system. Fancy, I know. And then uh, three months of that, and I knew one thing, and that was that I was ready to go back to school. So I ended up with a degree in economics and social science. And then fast forward a couple of years, and I found myself back in dentistry, and I never looked back. I just could not stay away. So finding ways to make dentistry affordable for patients while also maximizing reimbursement for dentists so that they could continue to provide quality of care really became a passion for me. Uh, I probably had every role in a dental office other than being a dentist or a hygienist, including scheduling coordinator, treatment coordinator, dental biller, office manager, practice management consultant, leadership coach. Uh, I've even been known to throw on my janitor hat uh, and be a warm body dental assistant when need be. Um, and I just want to preface and say to you guys, my best skill set is used outside of the operatory. Uh, if you're looking for a dental assistant, I'm not your gal. Uh, I joined eAssist as a success consultant doing dental billing while I built my consulting company, transitioned into their launch team, and then eventually made my way over to eAssist Publishing and Practice Booster where I get to live my passion of helping practices all over the country on revenue cycle management and insurance coding and administration. So needless to say, I am very passionate about today's topic and all of the ways that eAssist has really honored their commitment to uh, deliver peace of mind. So the goal for today is to have you walk away knowing the three things that you see up here on your screen. Uh, the first being which dental billing steps are just as important as sunscreen. Uh, two, how to avoid unnecessary denials and rejections so that cash flow is coming into your practice even when you aren't. And then number three, how investments in revenue cycle management solutions will result in long-term gains for your practice and your patients. So we all know just how important sunscreen is, right? And if you've ever had uh, a killer sunburn, you know um, exactly how painful it can be when you skip this super important step before stepping out into the blazing sun. So we're gonna talk about proactive steps that you can take today to protect yourself from the pain and the damage that can um, often come from just not being prepared. So I want to uh, start with a poll and ask you guys, when are you verifying patient insurance benefits? So let's just say it's a gorgeous Saturday and you decide that you are going to soak up the sun at the pool and you put your uh, swimsuit on and you grab your towel and your favorite beverage and your flip flops and you're getting ready to head out the door. Maybe you've got a book in your hand or a speaker to listen to some music, and you realize that you are completely out of sunscreen. So do you chance it and hope that you don't get burned? Wouldn't it have been better if you had known ahead of time that your Sunbum SPF 50 uh, was empty? Well, the same thing applies to insurance. So best practice is to verify benefits two to three days in advance for scheduled patients, and then definitely before a patient walks through the door, which in some cases um, may be same, same day. Yet for whatever reason, the number one uh, missed billing step is insurance verification. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at those poll results. Do you think that we've had enough time there, Shoot? I'm going to say yes. Okay, two to three days in advance. That's awesome. You guys are doing great. So um, insurance verification 
uh, really is arguably the most important dental billing step because nothing else can actually happen without it, or I mean, at least not effectively and efficiently, right? So verifying insurance for every single appointment before the patient even walks through the door is really a non-negotiable for a profitable practice. So any time that we have a new patient or a patient's plan changes, we need to do more than just a simple eligibility check. We need to do a full insurance verification, which is really a deeper dive into things like coverage amounts, uh, covered and non-covered procedures, uh, frequency and plan limitations, et cetera. So why is insurance verification so important? I'm sitting here preaching at you. I'm telling you how important it is, um, but why? So the very first reason is that it allows us to confidently collect from the patient at the time of service because we have an accurate treatment estimate, which means we aren't chasing down money later from patients. And number two, it also minimizes rejections and denials by really ensuring that we have accurate information on file before the claim ever even goes out the door. So we know that we have everything that we need uh, to get claims sent out without errors uh, and with all of the necessary attachments. So insurance verification is really that uh, attention to detail, which will end up saving you time and energy and resources later uh, if and when that rejection or denial comes through. And the greatest part about both of these is that when we add them together, we are truly able to maximize office collections. So I love this graphic. I think it's super cute. Um, and it, it really is a testament to uh, what insurance verification does for us. So insurance verification literally keeps you from getting rolled over um, by building and solidifying trust with your patients. So the number one reason why patients uh, leave a dental practice is because they feel neglected. Yet a very close second is because they feel deceived by an incorrect treatment plan. So I want you to think about that for a minute. I mean, you guys spend roughly three to 5% of collections on marketing just to get these patients in the door only to lose them because they can't trust that you're quoting them an accurate estimation of services. Talk about a burn, you guys, that's brutal. Bypassing insurance verification, sadly, can have a, neg a negative impact on the financial discussions that you're having with your patients, which then can lead to unexpected account balances and denials from insurance, which in turn increases your accounts receivable and very sadly decreases your collections. So uh, it's important that you're not only checking eligibility, um, but that you're doing that deep dive of a full verification uh, for all new patients uh, and any time that a patient's plan changes so that you can present uh, accurate treatment estimates and collect from patients with confidence at the time of service. So best practice is to do a full verification of benefits on an annual basis. This is typically done at the beginning of the year uh, to really ensure that a patient's plan is active and to find out the details of, of their plan. So I'm not sure what your philosophy is, uh, but here's what I find. Most of the time, what needs to be done differently or where we need to pivot isn't on something that's super difficult or something that someone just doesn't know how to do. It's those uh, tasks which are fairly simple or easy to learn, yet there, uh, for whatever reason, just isn't enough time to actually do them or to do them well. And from what I've seen over the years, most practices are pretty good at verifying benefits for new patients because we don't have anything in our software yet. Right? It's, a big, it's a big trigger for us, so we know we need to put something in there. Where we begin to slip is with our existing patients coming in because we already have some type of insurance information in the computer. And simply asking the patient 
if they've had any changes to their insurance, isn't going to be sufficient because half of the time, let's be honest, they don't actually know. Uh, their plan may have terminated and they have new insurance, which means we're delaying payment because we're sending claims to the wrong payer. We also can't work up an accurate treatment estimate if we don't know how much of their annual maximum is remaining or if they've met their deductible. Or maybe, maybe their employer is using the same insurance company to administer their dental benefits, yet the, uh, they've changed up the type of plan that they're offering. And so the plan number changed. And if we don't correct that in our software, those claims are gonna get kicked back as a rejection, which again, only delays payment. So uh, I like this little fact over here on the right. 65% uh, of dental practices are insurance driven, which means that uh, things like inaccurate patient and insurance information is really gonna leave them uh, up a creek without a paddle. So if insurance verification isn't something that your practice is doing for every patient, then this is really something that as a team, I would highly recommend that you shift gears on because it can have a, a significant domino effect on the rest of your, your revenue cycle. So here are three things that you can do before clicking that submit button uh, to really help kind of eliminate this potential roadblock. So number one is to have a copy of the patient's insurance card and photo ID on file. Number two, is to check all claims to ensure that they have the correct patient information listed. These are gonna be things like the patient's uh, name, date of birth, ID number, um, you know, just to name a few. And I wanna circle back here to name. So making sure that the patient's legal name that's on their driver's license matches the name that insurance has on file is incredibly important especially when you think about um, patients being able to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. If the patient gets married and they update their driver's license, but they haven't updated their name with their insurance company, your claims are gonna get kicked back. And then the third thing over here on the right is to check all claims for the correct uh, insurance information. So this really means making sure that you have the right claims address, uh, the right group number, the electronic payer ID. Um, and I mean, come on, you guys, there are so many Deltas and Blue Cross Blue Shields out there, and they all have a unique address specifically to send claims to. Um, and if, for, if you are uh, sending an appeal, for example, a lot of times that appeal address is going to be different uh, than, the, than the claims address. So making sure that you're, you're sending it where you need to send it. So our, our stats uh, have revealed that roughly 9% of uncollected revenue is left on the table uh, because of missed dental billing steps, one of which is not matching the appropriate CDT code to the service that's being provided. So let's break that down and kind of take a look at what that would look like uh, for your practice uh, over the length of a, of a dental career of, say, 40 years. So if your practice is generating $500,000 of annual revenue, 9% of that is $45,000 of lost revenue every single year, every single year. Multiply that by 40 years, and that's $1.8 million over the course of your career. Now, what if your practice is generating a million dollars in revenue each year, right? This is going to impact things even more. 9% of that would be $90,000 of lost revenue every year. And in 40 years, that's $3.6 million, million dollars of lost revenue. So matching the appropriate CDT code to the service provided is critical. And the golden rule of dentistry is to always code for what you do. And without up-to-date coding resources, you really have no idea if what you're reporting is even accurate, and you're also putting the practice at risk for things like audits, as well as lost revenue. So every year, there are changes to the rules governing dentistry. 
uh, and there are changes to our actual current dental terminology code set, uh, which is set forth by the ADA. So ignoring or not being aware of these changes is going to inevitably result in delayed or denied claims. So if you want to ensure timely reimbursement, it is imperative that you stay up to date uh, on these changes. So this year alone, the ADA's Code Maintenance Committee made a total of 46 changes to CDT 2022. So where exactly do these codes come from? The Code Maintenance Committee meets in Chicago every single March to review any proposed changes to the CDT code set. And where do those proposed changes come from? People like you guys. So if any of you code geeks out there uh, feel like something is missing from the uh, CDT or that something is outdated, or maybe it just needs to be clarified, you can actually go to the ADA website to submit a proposed change. And as long as it's done by November 1st, then it will be added to the meeting um, of things to discuss uh, the following March. So similarly in medicine, there are the ICD codes or International Classification of Diseases and our CPT or Current Procedural Terminology Code Sets. Um, most of us are familiar with these uh, if you do any type of medical billing. However, uh, there are some dental payers out there that actually require ICD coding for certain procedures. So ICD-10 codes are the ones that we're the most used to. These are our diagnostic codes rather than our procedural codes like the CDT. These are telling us why something needs to be done versus what exactly uh, has been completed. So there have been some changes to ICD-10. Um, ICD it's been updated to ICD-11. Um, they have been officially approved and they were re uh, released on January 1st of this year but they have not been implemented in the United States quite yet. And the timeline as to when that will happen is a little unclear. The only thing we know is that it's coming. So just something to be mindful of. Um, as for updated resources, the ADA has two publications. One, uh, which is basically just a list of the current codes. And then the other is what they call the companion. So the Companion is a really great publication that's full of questions and answers and examples, um, and it's definitely worth having. But prior to joining Practice Booster um, and doing consulting, I was an office manager. And my number one go-to resource to ensure that my practice was submitting accurate and up-to-date coding um, was uh, Coding with Confidence and Practice Booster's online code advisor. So the Coding with Confidence manual has 500 some odd pages uh, full of codes and explanations, uh, do's and don'ts, narratives, examples, uh, coding for very specific products or brands of things so that you know where it fits in. Um, it, it's really the most comprehensive coding manual or reference that's on the market. And Dr. Charles Blair, um, who is amazing, love him to death, has produced and annually updated this book for decades. So it really is still the GOAT when it comes to uh, insurance coding. And then Practice Booster also offers an online subscription, which includes the Digital Code Advisor database. So this is a subscription that you go online to. I really liked it because I was more kind of a tech person. There were some times when I wanted a book in my hand and then other times when I wanted to be able to uh, type something in or search it because I didn't really know where to look at in the book. And this will uh, do that for you. It pops up probably more information uh, than you want to know <laughs> when it comes to that. And then as a subscriber, you also get access to things like their uh, call center support. That would be for like those tricky questions that you just can't seem to figure out on your own. Uh, you get their insurance solutions newsletter, which is a bi-monthly publication that sort of keeps you uh, abreast as to uh, the, the changes in our industry as they happen. Um, our Code Advisor podcast, you get forms, documents, I mean, the list sort of goes on. And then because we mentioned medical billing, if you uh, are doing medical billing now, or if you're thinking about it, and you just kind of want to learn more about it, I would uh, check out the Medical Dental Cross Coding book. So this is something where you can look up the CDT code that you would use, and it's going to cross-reference that and then tell you exactly which medical code that you should use on that medical claim form. 
So again, this is very important. If you're not using updated coding resources, please reach out to your Henry Scheinfeld service rep and they will connect you uh, with the resources that you need on coding books and resources. So when we talk about coding correctly, I want to be very clear about the fact that it's a team effort. It takes a village to really make sure that all of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And we see practices all the time investing in top of the line materials and equipment from a clinical standpoint, yet for whatever reason, they aren't making that minimal investment in the coding resources that can truly yield a significant return on their investment. So here is our pro tip, um, investing in current, complete, and accurate billing reference materials every single year will improve claim reimbursement, treatment planning, and so much more. And it's important that your entire team is trained and you're not relying on just one team member to handle all of this for you. So if you're not sure where to go for training, we have some incredible webinars in our on-demand library at dentalzine.com. Uh, as well as we offer customized training, which really takes a deeper dive into the coding practice, uh, coding practices unique to your uh, office uh, through, through Practice Booster. And I say all of this to only really kind of drive home uh, that there's no excuse for not getting your team up to speed. There are resources all over the place. So the next step in vacation proofing your revenue is really to make sure that you're sending clean primary and secondary claims uh, or even tertiary or quaternary if you're sending uh, claims to three and four insurances. So what do I mean when I say clean claims? So clean claims are free of errors and they include any and all necessary supporting documentation. And this is huge, you guys. So huge that we're writing a whole new book dedicated to clinical teams on proper clinical documentation. You can reach out to your Shine Rep about that. Um, I think pre-orders uh, start uh, August 15th. Uh, I know that this has been a huge request. This has been something that people have really been wanting. Um, and I just can't tell you how many times claims are denied simply because the right attachments weren't sent or because the clinical notes don't reflect the necessity for treatment. So how detailed and accurate are your chart notes when it comes to documenting necessity? Truly, because one thing you guys should know is that narratives are really becoming a thing of the past when it comes to insurance. Most insurance companies are bypassing this altogether and they're asking for a copy of your, <clears throat> excuse me, your chart notes. So sending claims free of errors starts uh, by making sure that you're submitting claims on the most recent version of the ADA claim form, uh, which was last updated in 2019. So the reason that I say this is because some softwares uh, still have the 2012 version plugged in there and they will default to that. So if you're sending electronic claims, um, make sure that you, uh, you get that switched over. And if you're not sure how, just reach out to the support team uh, for your practice management software. Next up is um, making sure that you're submitting the right fees on your claim form when you're sending them to insurance. Um, if you're submitting PPO fees because you think it'll minimize adjustments, um, you could really be missing out on an exponential amount of revenue. When a patient has more than one plan, a secondary may coordinate up to the amount that was submitted on the claim form. So if your, if your full practice fee for a, a crown is $1,000, and let's say your patient has dual insurance and both plans pay 50% for major services, okay? Submitting that $800 Delta fee on your claim form means you're missing out on potentially $200 worth of revenue. Now think about how many crowns you do in a year. So if you're submitting PPO fees on your claims, that thought alone should make you pretty sick to your stomach. If you wanna minimize adjustments and errors, best practice is to post the practice or the full practice fee uh, to the ledger in addition to the claim form, not by submitting the fee schedule uh, amount to insurance. 
Uh, clean claims also uh, require that the correct provider is listed on the claim form. So this is the doctor that rendered or supervised treatment. And some of you are gonna laugh when you hear this, but your hygienist name does not go on the claim form. If you have an associate that isn't credentialed yet with a patient's plan, your name does not go on the claim form. The associate's name and MPI go on the claim form and it'll be processed as out of network until they can become credentialed. So if you're a multi-doctor practice or you're an owner doc thinking of bringing on an associate, make sure that you know everything that needs to be done to get everyone credentialed. And I know that it's a pain and I know that it's a headache, but that's what e-assisted care for, right? That's one of the one of the services that they offer. And there are just some things out there that are worth letting someone else do because it keeps you from losing your mind. So true story, uh, I don't clean my own house. I can do it. I know how. And uh, you can be sure that I am meticulous in the details. But I also have a career that I am extremely passionate about that a lot of times takes me away from my family for things like speaking or coaching. And when I'm home, I want to spend time with my family. I don't want to bust my tail cleaning house only to wake up the next morning and go right back to work. So when I come home and the floors smell clean and they sparkle and there's like zero sign of my golden retriever's hair <laughs> everywhere, uh, and there's no dust. And you guys, the bathrooms, when the bathrooms are so clean that you can't wait to be the first one to shower, right? That's priceless. That is worth every single penny. So do what you need to do. Uh, if credentialing is a, is a sore spot for you, let ESS take care of it for you. Um, so moving on to, to the next bullet, how do we know that our claims are clean? How do we know? Because we're looking at every single one of them before they are ever even submitted. Every line item, every attachment, every clinical note, every code, every provider, everything. If you were doing a filling and you prepped a tooth, would you place composite and just bypass the bond? Would you bond without curing? Absolutely not. Would you place a filling and send a patient out the door without checking their bite? No, this is the same thing. The details matter. So we have another pro tip here for you. Every time that a claim is processed, I want you guys to know that and I know that you know this, but I'm just gonna remind you that you're not the only ones that receive a copy of that EOB. The patient gets one too. And some of them, some of them are just waiting until it comes in the mail. And when they get that EOB in the mail and it matches exactly what you worked up in your treatment estimate, they know that they can trust you with the thing that they value the most and that their livelihood depends on, their money. You don't like being taken off guard when an EOB tells you that you have to take a massive write-off. Well, patients don't like getting an unexpected bill in the mail asking for more money than what we quoted them. So let's talk about uh, resolving rejected and denied claims. And I have a fun fact here for you. Only 33% of appealable claims are ever actually filed. 33%. Why? because either teams don't know that they can appeal or they don't know how. And what ends up happening instead? It ends up getting written off. Take buildups, for example. Most payers will automatically deny a buildup upon initial submission. Why? Because insurance companies know that only 30 out of 100 deny buildups will ever actually be appealed. And yet those 30 that are appealed with proper documentation, of course, typically get paid. So now let's talk a little bit about the different ways that a claim can be vetoed uh, by insurance and whether or not we can appeal. So a claim can be rejected, uh, disallowed, or denied. Uh, a rejected claim is a claim that's returned uh, because it can't be processed. So this would uh, mean something like uh, the CDT code, that was submitted on the claim form has been deleted. This would cause a claim to be rejected because the adjudication software at the insurance company no longer recognizes the code. In other words, you and the insurance company just aren't speaking the same language. Rejected claims uh, a lot of times can be resolved 
um, by sending a corrected, a corrected claim. Now, when a claim is uh, deemed disallowable or non-billable, the payer has determined that it doesn't qualify for reimbursement and you can't charge the patient. So an example of this might be uh, completing more than two quads of SRP in a single visit without doing a pre-authorization. Um, the additional quadrants, those other two quadrants might be disallowed. Disallowed claims are not appealable. Denied claims are claims for services that the insurance company has determined don't qualify for reimbursement. So for example, like we just talked about a buildup uh, and this might be denied because there isn't enough supporting documentation for necessity of treatment. Um, denied claims, may actually be appealable. And so best practice here is to contact the payer and speak with a representative directly to obtain whatever additional information uh, as to why that procedure was denied. A lot of times, you guys, it could be a simple fix that allows that claim to then be reprocessed uh, and paid. So next, we need to make sure that we're following up on outstanding claims on a regular basis. We can't trust insurance companies to pay every single claim that goes out and to do so in a timely manner. So we have to follow up. So here is uh, another uh, poll question for you guys. How often do you follow up on outstanding insurance claims? Once a month, twice a month. You don't know what that is. <laughs> you, could, you could do that too. So ideally, uh, claims should be followed up on uh, 14 days after initial submission, and then every 10 to 14 days after that until they're paid. But as we all know, that takes time. And it can't just be any time. This isn't something that you're doing while the phone is ringing and you're trying to check a patient out. Um, or maybe you're on hold <laughs> with insurance uh, trying to verify benefits. This really needs to be um, uninterrupted, dedicated time. And when we find that we don't have the time, what happens? It just doesn't get done. So let's take a look at our poll and see how often you guys are all following up on outstanding claims. Once a month, twice a month. All right, well, now you know. <laughs> For those of you who aren't following up on claims, let's change that. You can change that today. All right, so how do you know that your claims are actually being followed up on in a timely manner? How do you know? Uh, or maybe your team is saying it's happening, but how do you know? So the proof really is in the reporting, which in this case is going to be your accounts receivable report. So when you're running this report, I want you guys to make sure that you're filtering by aging category. So account balances less than 30 days uh, should represent only about 66% of your total. Uh, accounts 30 to 60 days should fall somewhere between the 10 to 25% range. And then your 61 to 90 days should be somewhere between the 5 and 10% range. And then anything over 90 days really should be less than 5%. Ideally, unpaid claims won't ever actually make it past that 90-day mark um, because this report is being worked and we're following up when we need to. Uh, we do have some of those instances where you're battling with the insurance company or whatnot. So hence the less than 5%. So my question for you would be, who in your office is accountable for this? And how frequently are you touching base to make sure that it's actually being done? So measurables create results. You guys need to make sure you create a system uh, in the office that the entire team understands and that they recognize and see the value of. Uh, if you have a bonus system in place that's based on collections instead of production, I guarantee you that your entire team is going to hold this person accountable because it impacts uh, the paycheck that they're bringing home. So the next way to vacation proof your practice is to post claim payments in a timely manner. So it's surprising to me when practices aren't doing this. And again, I think it's because People really have great intentions and they're doing the best they can uh, with the tools and the time that they have, uh, or maybe they just don't think that it's a big deal because uh, they're having, or you guys are signed up for EFTs, 
So they know the money's in the bank and they just don't have time for it. Um, yet when we're not posting to our practice management software on a regular basis, it really is going to delay those patient statements from going out. The other thing that we found is that the longer the time between treatment and the time that the patient is actually getting a statement, if they still owe anything, then the less likely it is that you're going to be able to collect. So it really can create a lot of damage between the patient and the practice relationship. So when you guys have tried contacting a patient to follow up, uh, how often have you heard, why am I just now hearing about this? My appointment was six months ago. Or uh, why didn't somebody tell me sooner? So be consistent and your patients won't only place trust in your practice, but they will also place trust in the quality of care that they received. For whatever reason, you guys, patients base your clinical skills and expertise on the experience they have with your business team. They have no way of assessing the margins of your crown prep, yet they can assume that if your business team is sketchy, then you probably are too. So our next pro tip is to post insurance payments within 24 hours of receipt to support consistent cash flow and ensure that the practice management software balances with your bank account. So every practice management software is different. So if you aren't clear on how to run a report uh, to show you the completed procedures that haven't been submitted to insurance, uh, make sure that you get with your software support team to walk you through how to do that. Um, I can't tell you how many times I will go into an office and see completed treatment just kind of sitting out there that's never been submitted on a claim form. Also make sure that you're cross-referencing your report with the clinical chart notes to make sure that the treatment was actually uh, rendered or completed. So sometimes treatment changes, we all know that. A patient might be scheduled for a root canal and ends up having an extraction. So your extraction is walked out and marked as completed uh, and submitted to insurance, but then you've got this root canal that's sitting out there in La La Land showing it was completed when it wasn't. So just make sure that you're running your reports and you're double checking with your clinical notes, uh, especially when you're creating a claim for submission. Remember we said we check everything before it goes out the door. Review the clinical notes to verify that the treatment that's been generated on that claim form is exactly what was documented in the clinical notes as completed for that date of service. This report is something that uh, you would run daily, uh, maybe for large practices with say 75,000 or, or more production on a monthly basis. Uh, for smaller practices, you could probably get away with running this weekly. Uh, if you need to go back and ask the doctor or the clinical team about it, it just it's important that you're doing this frequently because you want it to be fresh on their minds um, instead of you know, being confused. If you've never run this uh, report before, I want you to know it's gonna take you some time. This is, this is the truth circle right here, you guys. <laughs> um, but just know that it is possible. So best practice is to really start with the most recent and then work your way backwards to make sure that you're capturing those, those most recent procedures. Um, this isn't a report that you run one time and you stuff in your drawer and then you work on whenever you get time. So each time you sit down to work your procedures not attached, make sure you're generating uh, a new report. Next would be reconciling the practice management software and merchant statements with your bank account. And I cannot stress this enough. And sadly, this is something that um, many practices just aren't doing. So we have to make sure that we aren't losing track of the money. <laughs> um, EFT payments are great in that you get reimbursed from insurance much faster than say standard checks in the mail. However, these deposits need to be reconciled with your practice management software. For one, it safeguards you in ways from things like embezzlement, but for another, you could be following up on all these outstanding claims that have actually uh, already been paid. And let's not forget that while we aim for perfection, we're all human beings and mistakes can happen. That's why checks and balances are so important. Someone could add an extra zero to a payment or transpose numbers incorrectly. So reconciling your practice management software and merchant statements with your bank account will allow you to sort of catch these errors before they get out of hand. So are you checking your patient ledgers before sending statements? 
And how do you know where the balance comes from? So this again is where checks and balances really come into play. Detailed notes should be included for every insurance payment, documenting any outstanding balance and where it came from. So run the numbers associated with each claim and payment so that you can locate which dates of service actually created that patient balance. Your patients are gonna have more confidence in you when you can very quickly share with them what date of service the balance is coming from, uh, which in turn is going to make collecting from them much easier. So our pro tip, best practice is to have detailed account notes as to why the patient has balance. And you're gonna record these in the financial section, not the clinical note. You're gonna record them in the financial section of the practice management software uh, where uh, all of your team members really can have access to that. So here's another poll for you guys. How often are you sending statements? So I'm, I'm gonna share a story with you guys um, of an office uh, that I heard about. Uh, a friend of mine worked with this office um, and they hadn't sent a statement in over seven years. Seven, seven years. Their accounts receivable was over $600,000 and they ended up having to write off over a half a million dollars in uncollectible debt. Can you believe that? So hopefully you guys are sending statements out a little bit more consistently uh, than, than every seven years. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the results of that poll. All right, once a month, twice a month, you don't follow up. Okay, well, hopefully now you know why it's important and then you'll start doing that now, right? I'm just gonna assume that that's what you guys are gonna do. So how do you know that your claims are actually being followed up on in a timely manner? The proof is in the reporting, which in this case is going to be that um, accounts receivable report. So when you're running that report, again, make sure that you're filtering by aging category. Um, account balances, I feel like we already did this slide, did we not? Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so uh, revenue cycle management uh, involves consistent and routine follow-up on uh, outstanding claims, but also on uh, outstanding patient balances. Um, what does regular follow-up look like for your practice? So ideally, the goal is to set aside dedicated time every single week for sending statements and for following up on outstanding patient balances. So dedicated time, again, it means no interruptions. This is focused time that should be respected and valued by the team. When you're sending new balance statements on a regular basis, that might mean daily or for larger practices, that might mean weekly. So for example, week one for the month, you would send statements to patients with last names A through F. Week two, uh, G through L, week three, M through R, week four, uh, S through Z. And then for outstanding balances, best practice is to issue a statement on a monthly basis. And then if there's no response on the account after you've sent two statements, um, you're gonna start making phone calls. Uh, and then it might get to a point where it would be a good idea to send them a text message with a link where they could easily make a payment online and then uh, if you're still not hearing back from them, you're gonna need to start sending out those collection letters. Make sure that you are customizing your letter to really fit your office personality, along with exactly what you're gonna hold your patients accountable to. Um, best practice, uh, if you guys don't have these in place already, is to have a financial policy as well as a financial policy acknowledgement in place, which the patient would then sign at their initial visit in addition to a signed treatment plan and a financial agreement for any subsequent uh, treatment visits. So vacation doesn't have to delay and disrupt dental practice revenue. When systems are in place, you guys, the cash will flow. And if for some reason you're freaking out and you feel like this is a lot and it just doesn't feel prof like possible to you, I promise you that it is. All is not lost. Having these systems in place will help. 
And if you don't have the time to make sure that all of these things are being done on a consistent basis, or you don't have time to train new team members, please reach out to uh, your Henry Shine rep for more information on how eAssistant Solutions can deliver peace of mind uh, to your practice and really keep revenue flowing. And if you're curious about how eAssist has helped other practices just like yours, take a look at the numbers, right? The proof is in the reporting. Uh, the average dental practice monthly collection ratio is 91%. The average eAssist dental billing client collection ratio is 98.9%. And then eAssist clients with combined dental and patient billing have a monthly collection ratio over 100%. So do you remember when we were talking about the average dental practice leaving 9% of revenue on the table because of these missed billing steps? What does 9% look like for your practice? As we highlighted at the beginning of this program, eAssist provides peace of mind to dentists through increased revenue and decreased denials, but also in a myriad of other ways, such as continuing education through our on-demand platform, DentalZing, uh, as well as book publications and team training through Practice Booster. And why? Why do we do all that? Because we care. Because we know what it's like when we are struggling to focus on the patient standing in front of us because of leaks in our revenue cycle management. And we've made a commitment to all of you to pull you out of the sand and get you back on solid ground so you can do what you do best, provide the quality of dentistry and the experience that your patients can't help but want to go tell their friends and family about. eAssist is more than dental billing, and we are here for you. So if you'd like someone from eAssist's team to, uh, to reach out uh, and show you everything that they can do really to help support your team uh, and take some more of the frustrating parts of your day off of your plate, uh, answer yes to the poll question. Uh, eAssist really can help you focus more on your patient relationships uh, and truly providing quality of care uh, and the treatment, the treatment that you would want you know, for your own family. So if there's something that you feel like we could do to help, uh, or if you just have questions, just, say, just select yes. And that is the conclusion of our webinar. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging in there with me today. I hope that you learned uh, a lot, or you've at least got a couple of nuggets that you guys can take back with you into your practices. Um, and I guess it's time for a Q&A. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please type it into the box labeled have a question and we'll address them right away. We do have some questions, Tiffany, so let's jump right in. Is there any software that will update coverage tables and coverages for insurance plans automatically? Or are there any other companies that do this? I came across one company that wanted a minimum of $1,500 a month to do this. Um, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but I don't know the answer to that. Do we have an email for them? It's uh, webinars at henryshine.com. So if you will email that question, I know a lot of really smart people <laughs> that work with a lot of different softwares, and I will, um, I will get an answer for you. I don't personally have the answer to that specific question. And then we'll see if there are any other questions coming in, Tiffany. Any other questions, you guys, about revenue cycle management? All right, thank you again, Tiffany, for tonight's great presentation. If anyone has any outstanding questions, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email in the next week. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again on our future webinars. Hey, Tiffany, again, thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night, everyone.